entrepreneurs uh, to, to, to produce bigger value in the company. But at the beginning, it's a very difficult question. The thing is, if you, if you work in a company and, and there you are in the research labs, you have to accept the terms as they are. So if they offer you a percentage of the license fees or like a share, that's perfect. Without an upper boundary, then it's perfect, right? But if they don't, they may say, okay, you get a thousand, a thousand dollars, you know, in the first year of success and so. And but then you have to accept that or leave the company before you innovate, right? So, so you have to be clever there. But, but uh, when you talk to uh, you know potential financial partners, you you present them a business plan, you know, whatever your idea is, but, you know, and they eventually have a business plan. First thing these people will do is discount your business plan, big haircut, and uh, because things happen. And then these people will essentially do an NPV calculation. You know, if I invest X, my expected return is Y, and therefore I can pay you know this amount for this idea. And that's that's usually how it would work. And uh, the other thing that I think makes sense to do is to say, look, I have today I own the company. I have all my money in it. You know, I have whoever is around me. If you invest in my company. I let you have the first distribution. Yeah. And, but after that, because at that point, you're going to have your money back. After that, I want to claw back a big ownership. I would never sell, for example, you know, 50%, you know, 49% of my business to somebody up front. To say, I understand. I'm telling you a story. You have to believe me. So you put your money in. Once you get your money back, then your ownership goes down. Because I've proven what I was capable of, of, of doing. And so, so of course, that changes valuation, but, but that's, you know, try to retain as much as possible because the valuation haircut. Yeah. And again, you know, I'd say, be, you know, don't be penny wise and pound foolish. There's nothing wrong <coughs> about owning a small percentage of a company that's successful as opposed to owning 100% of a company that's never built. I think it's a really interesting concept, this entrepreneurship, but uh, then again, I think the culture of entrepreneurship, or rather what you mentioned, the garage culture, is very often missing in a large company, even in SMEs. And that's probably, it's a, for innovative concepts and ideas, it's probably actually a better thing that someone takes it apart, you know. Yeah, so, but look, yeah. That's, that's right, that's why there's so many people here that say, I don't want to work for a big company. In fact, I want to be you know, my, my own man. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that that's a good thing. Okay, uh, one sure. sentence. I want one sentence. In that story I said about the lie, I believe, and this is my dream, that kick will be this ally ready to help before somebody arrives to the success. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have to conclude now because it's already uh, over past 11. So uh, I really want to thank each member of the panelists for the valuable contribution, uh, accurate answer they provide to the, to the audience. And I want to thank as well all the audience for their, uh, let's say, live participation of uh, this debate. And I hope that uh, they will help you in your future uh, business development or uh, creation. Thank you. Thanks a lot.
give the EIT a grade, as it were. Let's, let's play a, a bit of a school exercise here. But one thing that I, I've learned, I mean, this, this morning and uh, yesterday, the discussion of, uh, in the workshops, the discussion of um, how to be successful, there was one factor on that list that, that was not there uh, that I think is absolutely vital, and that's flexibility. Uh, it's hard to, you know, it's hard when you're starting a business, and I have experience with this, to know that when you start off, you have to believe in your idea. You have to be more maniacal about it. But yet, at the same time, you can't be so bullheaded uh, that you refuse to change as you discover that you're not making any money, for instance. Uh, and it's the flexibility that's also very important for starting and running a venture. I think to a certain extent we've seen this also in the EIT as it has evolved uh, from first idea in uh, 2006, right? Yes, to uh, what it is now. And it's going to evolve again, I'm sure. That's the one certainty about the EIT. It, will, it's, it, it is designed in a way that will be flexible, flexible and change. So what I'd like to do with you and our panelists is to make suggestions. What can the EIT do over the next five years to encourage more entrepreneurship. What isn't it doing for entrepreneurship today that you think it could do? And we're, this is going to be very direct because we're going to come to you and ask you for suggestions. So uh, think about this for a little bit. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Daria here uh, listening, a board member of the, of the governing board. Yeah, we're taking notes, yeah. Uh, we have Anders, the vice chairman of the Anders Flugstone, uh, who is actually taking notes right now. Uh, and of course, uh, Jose Manuel and the entire EIT team are here also. So this is serious. Let's get some feedback from you. Now, to begin with, just checking it will fall off here. Uh, to begin with, however, just to get the ball rolling, I've asked the panelists to uh, give us a suggestion to start it off. Um, we have on the panel here, um, the, the, first of all, can you all hear me? Is this fine? Yeah. More, you, louder? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, we have here Lucia de Calde. Lu Lucia is the unit head in DG Education and uh, Culture at the European Commission in Brussels, who, as I think it was said at one point, uh, you've been with this, uh, this is very much, this whole concept is something that you and your team have been developing uh, since almost 2007, I think, right? Yeah, 2006. 2006 from the, okay, yes. So uh, she is also listening. Um, uh, beside her is Christian Weinberger. Uh, he's with another part of the commission, DG Enterprise and Industry. Uh, he's the Entrepreneurship and SME Policy Advisor, and as such, uh, Christian has a lot of experience about the different kinds of policy levels and problems that have to do with entrepreneurship in Europe. Um, beside him uh, is Nirena Vaksunovic. Uh, she is uh, with the European Students' Union, uh, actually from Belgrade, I think, originally. Yes, that's right. Uh, and so you will be bringing your perspective on this as well. Beside her is uh, Volker Franz. He's the Industrial Affairs Director of Business Europe. Business Europe is the, is the federation of European industry. Uh, and so he brings a, another perspective on this thing. Uh, Daria, you've met before several times. And at the end, uh, Alexandra Karima. Uh, she is uh, an I EIT ICT Labs student. Uh, uh, she, that is to say, you're with one of the kids specifically. Uh, and so you also bring in I guess an insider view. Yeah, I've been inactive for all the ideas, but you can access them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so to begin with, let's get a few ideas on the table. What could the EIT do to promote more entrepreneurship in Europe? Uh, who wants to begin? Okay. Yeah, um, Brandy. Um, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say um, I was very impressed by, by this whole conference, by the spirit. I heard loads of 
words that normally you don't hear in European conference, you know, excited, passionate, and hungry. And normally in the EU conference it's more like you hear this way, do the compromise, just have a cookie, you know. Uh, but that was great. Um, I would really like to have your input, your ideas on basically how to sell the uh, EIT in Brussels, because that's my job. I mean, my business is politics. I work for the European, for the European industry. I represent the European industry in Brussels. I, I sit in Brussels and I tell to people in the European Parliament, the European Commission, dear policy makers, please do this because it will enhance industrial competitiveness in Europe. Or definitely don't do that because it will seriously hamper industrial competitiveness in Europe. So, um, what can we say? What, what do we say about the EIT? In principle, of course, it's all business dreams of, it's all industry dreams of. Right? It's something that wants to enhance innovation, it's something that wants to enhance entrepreneurship. Uh, so, this is, in principle, the perfect, uh, the perfect project that we should support. However, concretely, I have the following problem. Um, in the next months, the next years, um, it will be decided how 80 billion euros uh, of EU money will be distributed to various research, innovation, competitiveness projects. 80 billion euros, more or less. Small change. Yes. For, for, for the period between 2014 and 2020. How much of that should go to the EIT? Um, of course, there are those people in this room who say, well, ideally all of it, huh? because this is, this is, this is what we need. Huh? Startups to uh, create to help in innovative ideas and entrepreneurs, <laughs> and this is this would create a lot of jobs. I mean, okay, EIT creating jo startups and <coughs> jobs. Yes, exactly. Uh, this is two steps to, to reach the okay the final goal. There's no right answer, by the way. There never is in marketing. It's whatever people buy. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maxime, and I was thinking that, well, referring to point of uh, France, uh, I would say that maybe first step we should uh, contextualize what is the place, what do we have? Let's say what is the industry out there? What is the needs? What is, what are your needs as I EIT? And then basically it's all about I think creating some. Uh, Entity or platform, you can put it that way, or open source, rather open source in the platform. platform. Oh heavens, no! <laughs> yes, that's a very Brussels word. But it's let's say it's it's not just a, a platform where you come and you like, hey, looks good and it's done. But like, hey, I know where is my place there, as industry, as academia, as entrepreneur, and I know what I can give to fulfill the interest. So you're basically linking the information uh, 
story to make. Okay, what, what, there's somewhere more than 10 words, but is there another, does anybody have 10 words? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, delivery prosperity by rediscovering Europe's innate innovative talent. <laughs> Repeat it again. Same yeah, I can't, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> delivering, prosperity. Deliver, delivering prosperity by rediscovering Europe's innate innovative talent, I think. Yeah, I think someone from the EIT may be hiring me. <laughs> uh, uh, one last, literally, ten words. Yeah. This is 10 words? <laughs> okay. Uh, for the, like the Harry Potter, I mean, I love the IT School of, because in Harry Potter, the school is Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. So I wrote, like, I, I, the IT School of Witchcraft to entrepreneurial students via Wizardry of Technology. The so Wizardry of, te of Technology, yeah. Yeah, kind of Wizards of the Future. Okay, well, of course, one last ask, how long is the Harry Potter brand going to be? I, I, I have to say yes. that the, the witchcraft world was very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. Volker, you said you had a suggestion. Did you? Did I hear that right? You had an idea or not? Well, uh, but not those, this 10 word thing. Mm -hmm. uh, ah. So I have some ideas, but of course, she, not, not, I don't have the brand. Okay. It, does anybody have a quick No, actually, one thing, one thing. I like the um, <laughs> idea of Alexander von Gabin to call kids innovation factories. Innovation factories. If I can say, let's give some money to the European innovation factory, that's it's a bit more telling. Okay. But fundamentally, Boca, your point is that there should be some kind of a quick way to say. Motivation. That actually motivates people to buy it. Yeah. Or to work.